सभी को नमस्ते सबसे पहले आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक प्रबुद्ध भारत फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू इंटरेक्ट विद दिस वंडरफुल ऑडियंस इन बेलगांव माई रिस्पेक्ट्स टू ऑल द सीनियर्स प्रेजेंट ओवर हेयर एंड बिफोर आई स्टार्ट विद द टॉपिक ऑन हिस्ट्री इट हैज़ ऑलवेज बीन अ सब्जेक्ट इन विच आई नेवर हैड इंटरेस्ट in fact it was one of my worst subjects as far as i remember and uh, then when i grew up studying physics and then started teaching physics for a considerable period of time i was of a firm opinion that teaching history to students is sheer waste of time because it is an absolutely rubbish and stupid subject for which the valuable time of students should never ever be utilized um but somehow uh, during my interaction with students i was normally interacting with interacting with the students of physics subject uh, there was this growing feeling that perhaps there is something wrong with either the perceptions of student regarding history or maybe i have some wrong ideas about history and that is how i somehow got interested into history and here i am in front of you talking about a subject which i always hated in the morning session when uh, sahasar budde ji was talking he made a very pertinent point which just leapt out of his speech and i uh, it's just uh, hanging in my mind i'll share it with you he said that um, every nation every community every society writes his or own his right writes their own history and we should also write our own history now an indirect message that was that nobody is going to write your history for you you have to write your own history but if now uh, since i have grown a little wiser i would say as compared to 10 years ago um and after going through a lot of history and related subjects there is a very very famous quote which comes to mind that one who controls history controls the future and now i am of a firm opinion that if we intend to be world leaders as we aspire to be then history is one of the most pivotal subjects to which we have to uh, pay our attention and uh, if we are not going to write our history someone else is going to do it for us because history is a tool to manipulate to control population and uh, considering the way the democracies work considering the way oligarchies work or monarchies monarchies work everybody has every ruler has his or her own special interest in controlling history because unless and until you can control the minds of people you cannot have a very strong or a stable rule so it's uh, in that sense it's very pragmatic for them to do and very selfish for them to do now equally selfish it becomes for us that our history is written correctly why is it so when we talk of controlling mind how do we do that there was this famous movie i think initially it was made in a south indian language i don't know which one and later on it was uh, copied by amir khan the name was gajni that movie has a protagonist who suffers from that problem of short term memory loss how many of you have seen that movie okay pretty large number so that makes my job easier now in that there is this particular scene in which the protagonist is trying to find out the villain and planning to kill him and the villain knows that he can only remember it for 15 minutes if i come in front of him after 15 minutes he'll not be able to identify me as his enemy and then i won't be a threat to him and that is exactly what he does over there that is the point which we have to discuss today over here that how are we into that similar role of that protagonist 
during numerous student exchange programs which we've been having, I often notice, I've often noticed that when our students are interacting with foreign students, there is a very distinct difference between their body languages. You look at American students, Japanese students, Germans. These three have uh, very carefully observed. They are proud of their roots. They are so confident that we are Americans, so we are special. We are Japanese, so we are special. We are Germans, so we are special. Compared to them, now I am talking of student exchange programs in which we were sending the best of our brains. They appeared uh, technically, academically, they were very fine. But the moment the discussion veered off to history, to nation, it appeared as if our students were even lacking a spine to stand. They were almost apologetic. And that is when I started studying history books, which are currently in uh, currency. These books were uh, introduced in 2005-2006 session when UPA1 came and uh, still they are continuing. So I'll try to share some snippets from those books with you. One is, there is one on your screen right now. Now this is from class seventh, page number 10. I just request you to read it. It's a very small paragraph from NCRT book of class seven. What they're saying is, in 1318, the poet Amir Khusro noted that there was a different language in every region of this land Sindhi, Lahori, Kashmiri, Dwarsamudri, Telangani, Gujri, Malabari, Gauri, Avadhi, and Hindavi in the area around Delhi. Now this seems to be very innocuous, very harmless kind of quote. A different language in every region of this land. Nothing remarkable about it. Now, uh, in the previous sessions, somebody was saying that there is a very large section of society to which it has been imposed that India is an artificial entity which was created in 1947 by Britishers. Before that, no idea of a unified India or unified Bharat existed. Look at this portion which is coming up. What I did was, I went through NCRT books. When I noted this, I filed an RTA application with NCRT and I requested to them that kindly share with me the original document from which you have taken this quote. The reply of NCRT was that we don't have any records available with our department. So that was the first roadblock which I had to face. Then I started reading the actual sources of these history, uh, history assertions which they are, being, they are making in NCRT books. I stumbled upon a book written by two British historians. They wrote it in 1850s, about 175 years ago. It's an eight volume series which is known as uh, history of India as told by its own historians, by Eliot and Dawson. So in that eight volume set, I found out this portion and now read it. What Amir Khusro actually had written was, the quote is, as I was born in Hind, I may be allowed to say a word respecting its languages. There is at this time in every province a language peculiar to itself and not borrowed from any other. This is his original quote, which has been which was written in Persian and translated into English. Notice the words Hind. He is unequivocally saying that he's talking about languages of this country, Hind, which means it was a united entity at that point of time. Second, he's praising the languages. Third, every province of a has a language, again uh, reinforcing the idea that these are provinces of Hind. Now this single sentence, if our students are going to re read this sentence, they will be absolutely clear that we have a very old country, we have a very old civilization, and all this diversity of languages was, has always been a part of our socio-cultural ethos. Now think about what kind of self-confidence this single sentence can give them. And compared to it, the filtered or sanitized version which is being fed to our students and if there are any students right now in this room, they must have gone through this because these books are in currency for last uh, 15 plus years. Then again what he says, 
that quote comes up then again he says these are all languages of hind which from ancient times have been applied absolutely no doubt about antiquity of our country now let us go to what ncert has further done there they have disconnected the quote they have inserted their own remarks what are they amir khusro went on to explain that in contrast to these languages there was sanskrit which did not belong to any region it was an old language and common people do not know it only the brahmans do now try to understand the import of this portion sanskrit which did not belong to any region why is it so why are they doing it this way because there is this constant thread which runs into the entire ncert history book series from 6th class to 12th class what is that that brahmans were invaders they were aryans they came from somewhere outside they brought sanskrit with it with it and since today i am in karnataka in south india this divisive language narrative is very much alive and kicking in many states over here where there is an animosity towards sanskrit now how would you build that animosity how would you create it how would you nurture it this is one of the examples over here sanskrit does not belong to any region only brahmans know it so what they have done is they were giving a quotation then they are putting their own remarks and then writing in italics common people do not know it only the brahmans do this is what ncert says now what does the actual source say but there is another language more select than the others which all the brahmans use its name from old is sanskrit look at the contrasting difference between them he is praising sanskrit is again very clearly saying that this is language of india which has been here for in, since time immemorial and he is appreciating it but since it is to be used as a tool for narrative building and to create fault lines and to widen those fault lines that is the kind of language which they are using i don't know whether i am able to communicate the significance of this or not when i was pursuing my physics i used to study psychology as a hobby in the applied psychology portion where they talk about propaganda there is a very common technique which is specially effective with kids it is known as transfer of ownership of information how does it work let us say i am controlling a class of maybe 10 12 year old kids and i okay let us have an example over here suppose i tell you that i am uh, an economy expert and last year the economy of china was 10 trillion dollars okay then i go on with my lecture for maybe 4 5 minutes now i ask that i am going to give a prize to anyone who tells me what was the size of chinese economy since i have just given you that information it is fresh in your minds most of you are going to raise your hand and suppose i ask 20 people out of you so you are going to give the same answer which i had supplied with supplied whether that was correct or incorrect is immaterial but you gave that answer now imagine a 12 year old kid when he or she is going to say yes sir this was the answer and then he'll go back to his home mama aaj mujhe very good bola ma'am ne kyu bola maine unko sahi answer diya tha and during this process what has happened is now he has owned that information that i had given that answer so this is true here you can see that practically happening with ncert do you remember what amir khusro had to say regarding sanskrit knowledge and brahmans so 12 year old kid has been fed with the information that this language does not belong to india only brahmans use it and this page is going to reinforce that entire information in that 12 year old child by the time he'll become 20 25 years old he'll become a rabid periodist or whatever you whatever are the names given to these people and then what is the content over here now look at this main portion main body it was during this period that important changes occurred in what we call hinduism today look at that disparaging language which they are using what we call hinduism today as if it is something very new these included the worship of new deities construction of temples by royalty now this is 
these things appear to be very innocuous. But they are not so innocuous actually. The construction of temples by royalty. So, the emotions of common people should not be associated. Therefore, they have to be specifically bracketed with royalty. And then, and the growing importance of Brahmans, the priests as dominant groups in society. So, at subliminal level, the message is that Brahmans were coming from outside. They were um, having some kind of partnership, alliance with royalty. That is why temples were being built up. And then notice the word dominant group. This is uh, called playing with words. There are in psychology, they are called negative words and virtue words. When you have to produce a positive effect, you use positive words having positive connotations, they are called virtue words. Then dominant is always a negative, negative word. So that is what they are associating with Brahmins. And then look at the last line. Their knowledge of Sanskrit text earned the Brahmins a lot of respect in society. So what they are effectively saying is that Brahmins were not respected because they had high character, because they led a frugal life. They were respected just because they had knowledge of Sanskrit texts. All is being produced in a very reductionist manner. This north-south divide which has to be created, how is it being fostered on kids? Again, an example from class 7th. This is, I think, page number 10. Take the term Hindustan, for example. Today, we understand it as India, the modern nation state. When the term was used in the 13th century by Minhaj Siraj, a chronicler who wrote in Persian, he meant the areas of Punjab, Haryana and the lands between the Ganga and Jamuna. He used the term in a political sense for lands that were a part of dominions of Delhi Sultan. The areas included in this term shifted with the extent of the Sultanate, but the term never included South India within it. And then by contrast, in the early 16th century, Babur, let's skip that, look at the last line. While the idea of a geographical and cultural entity like India did exist, the term Hindustan did not carry the political and national meanings which we associate with it today. So, North-South divide is being fed into our kids for the last 16 years by using the vehicle of textbooks. So, maybe I'm a right-winger. I'm reading a lot into it, although I hate this terminology of right wing and left wing. I, being a teacher, am of a firm opinion that if I'm going to teach something to my students, it, it can have only two criteria. Before coming to that, what happens normally is everything has been so politicized that the moment you start talking about this, someone will stand up and say, this is saffronization. Someone will say, no, 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 this is Marxist writing. That is the kind of politicization that is being done with education. Now, being a teacher, I think that there can be only two camps. One is the camp in which you tell truth to the students or you tell falsehood to the students. There is no other division possible. So, if all this is true, we should accept it. We can accept students were outsiders. They came over here. They dominated the Mool Nevasi, push them downwards, and then we should make proper corrections in our uh, social behavior. Uh, since I, then I started studying history books that what is actually, what has actually been the position of India, whether South India was included in it or not. The first source that I laid my hands on was Mahabharat. The word itself tells you Mahabharat, right? And when we start looking at the description that is given in the entire corpus of Mahabharat. That tells you that the boundaries of Bharat start from Himalayas and go all the way down to Indian Ocean. But then Mahabharat is what? Brahmanical literature, Brahmanical conspiracy, right-wing conspiracy, BJP conspiracy, RSS conspiracy. Right? Then who sh whom should we, we consider a neutral observer? So this quotation I've taken from a book which is known as Kitabul Hind. It was written by Al Biruni, a Muslim chronicler who had come to India along with Mahmud Ghazni about thousand years.
from now. And in this book, he is writing about geography of India. And what does he say? Uh, you can go through all this, but just look at the right uh, red colored portion. One of these plains is India, limited in the south by the above mentioned Indian Ocean, and on all three other sides by the lofty mountains, the water of which flow down to India. Now, does it, does, does it leave any room for any doubt? The southern frontier of India is formed by the Southern Ocean. This was written when there was no RS Samaj, when there was no RSS, no BJP. So it cannot be called a, what they say, Sanghi conspiracy. Um, this template which our kids are studying for last 15, 16 years, I am limiting my discussion do, to the books which are presently in currency, but this narrative have, has been pushed down our throats since 1947. What is the objective of this? Um, in 1990s, to be more specific, in 1994, there was a very brutal civil war which had taken place in Rwanda. I don't know how many people are aware of it. There was this bloodbath in Rwanda. It is a small uh, nation in Africa. And within a period of four months, eight lakh people were killed on the streets of Rwanda. And if you consider the small size of Rwanda, you can appreciate the amount of havoc that was played over there. But how did it happen? You know, what was, the, what was present in the history books of Rwandan students? Um, their society consisted of three kinds of people. They were called Twa, Hutu and Tutsi. Twa were about 1%, Hutu about 80% and uh, Tutsi about 19%. <coughs> the history books which were written during colonial period, they were telling them that the Tutsis have invaded Rwanda from north, they were lighter skinned. The original inhabitants or the Mulnevasi of Rwanda were Hutus. And these cunning people, these cunning Tutsis came from north and started suppressing the local population and then mixed up with them, bred with their women and now they have totally dominated the society. And this narrative was being fed to them for about 90 years. And this hatred kept on simmering, kept on building up during this entire period. Actually what was happening was that it was a social categorization based on the number of cattle somebody owned in Rwanda. Anybody who had a higher amount of cattle, he was considered to be a Tutsi somebody who had less was considered to be a Hutu. It was a very fluid kind of demarcation. When uh, Dutch colonialists went over there and Belgians went over there, now whenever somebody colonizes, they have to control the population and controlling the population is done best by creating a bureaucracy and bureaucracy works when you just simplify all those things. When you can clearly identify who is what and who is what not. So they, what they did was, they started issuing identity cards to the entire population. And when they issued those identity cards, they were to be permanent. So every, anyone who was a Hutu was to be a Hutu. His generations were to be a Hutu. Anyone who was a Tutsi was to be a Tutsi. So a very mobile, a very fluid classification was uh, made to be permanent, permanently rigid by the colonial masters. And on the basis of that, a narrative was created to create fault lines among them, to create hatred for 20% of people in the minds of 80% of people. And ultimately it culminated in the killings of more than 8 lakh people. Now same template, same colonial masters, they applied in our country also. And unfortunately, the White-skinned masters went away, but the same colonial narrative is running right now. So when you hear sporadic incidents of anti-Brahmanism, where a Brahman is killed or lynched or whatever happens, 
you can put the blame right over here. This is what is being done. Now, uh, this, how does it, how is it being done? When this Rwandan genocide took place, a lot of research was done by behavioral scientists, by psychologists, by psychiatrists. They've come up with this terminology, identity and disidentity. Whenever you have to disrupt a society, first you have to give them an identity. Then you have to feed into them the narrative that you have been exploited. Uh, I'll give an example for this. I used to uh, play a prank with my friends. I used to say that I'm studying palmistry and I've become quite uh, perfect at it. So show me your hands and I'll tell you about you. And sure enough, there would be enough palms thrusted on my face. And my favorite sentence was, Yaar, tu to sabka bahut dhyan rakhta hai. Tu to sabko bahut pyaar karta hai, lekin tujhe utna na reciprocal mein nahi milta. Master stroke hota hai. Everybody wants to think that he or she is of that kind. And this works perfectly everywhere. Sab bolte hai, aray yaar, tu to bada achcha palmist ban gaya, bade chote se time mein. That is what used to happen. And that is what is used during identity politics. You have to tell a population that you have been crushed, you've been dominated, you've been repressed, you've been suppressed, you've been exploited. And now is the time to take revenge. Now how does it work? That means a person who is finding himself or herself in an unfortunate situation, he does not have to blame himself or herself. He is going to blame somebody else which is the easiest thing to do. And that is where disidentity comes. You give an identity, then you supply a villain of that disidentity, which in Rwanda, they gave Tutsis, and in India, it is Brahmins, or sometimes called upper castes, or sometimes called North Indians, or sometimes called males, depending on the kind of narrative that is being worked out. This is from class eighth. Uh, social reform movement, when the is being fed to our students, what is being taught. There were also others who questioned the injustices of the caste social order. During the course of 19th century, Christian missionaries began setting up schools for tribal groups and lower caste children. These children were thus equipped with some resources to make their way into a changing world. Now does it make sense? That first tell them, that your religion is bad, you are not Hindus, they came from outside, Brahmins came from outside, you were never those. You have been exploited and who, is, who has emancipated you? Christian missionaries have emancipated you. One of the most vocal amongst the low caste leaders was Jyoti Rao Phule, born in 1827. He studied in schools set up by Christian missionaries. On growing up, he developed his own ideas. Look at the contradiction. He studied in missionary schools, but he developed his own ideas about the injustices of caste society. He set out to attack the Brahmins, claim that they were superior to others since they were Aryans. Phule argued that Aryans were foreigners who came from outside the subcontinent and defeated and subdued the true children of the country, those who had lived here from before the coming of the Aryans entire Rwandan template. This is how it works out. Now incidentally what I did was, I started correspondence with NCRT and uh, when they failed to respond, I filed a petition with the Punjab and Haryana High Court. I said that this is what is being done wrongly with our students and these books should be changed. Now it was a very hefty petition, about 1300 pages. So the judges said that, okay, uh, we are not going to go through this petition. You send it to NCRT, and if they do not give you proper reply, then you can come back to us. So I wrote to them, I wrote to NCRT, I gave the entire petition, petition to them. One of the points was that since there is no scientific basis, no scientific documentation, no scientific record that there was ever any RN invasion theory, then why are you teaching this theory to our students. They asked for instances. I gave them this instance. That here it is unequivocally being written that Brahmins were Aryans 
they came from outside. You know what their answer was? They said, we don't have any evidence for this, but we want our students to know what Jyoti Rao Phule thought about at that point of time. I think I've made my point. Uh, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much for listening to me. Good afternoon. I am again, once again, Dr. Satish Biradar from Bidar. <coughs> my question to you is, uh, you know, is very uh, like uh, slightly self-introspection sort of a thing. Uh, like uh, if we had such a glorious past, such a rich culture, uh, where we fail to defend ourselves as a nation and uh, went uh, from a very, very rich uh, nation to a very poor nation. And uh, uh, till date we are, you know, uh, facing the consequences. Yeah. Why is it that if we were at the peak of our civilization, how could barbarians invading defeat us and put, it, put us in such a sorry state? Um, there can be numerous answer to, answers to that. One of those is that nature is always changing. So if we look at the history of our nation, we always had Chakravarti Rajas who would unite the entire nation. And then after that peak, it will slowly start to disintegrate, there would be uh, regional satraps coming up. Then again somebody would come up, united like Chanakya did, again it would start disintegrating. So this process keeps on happening. And uh, about 1300 years ago when Islam started originating over there in Middle East, they created a band who were inspired by looting other population, by kidnapping their wives inducting them into their harems. Uh, that was like ultimate inducement to anybody, any fighting male which you could give. And they had a very large army at their disposal. Initially, since we had that uh, tradition of fighting, the Kshatri tradition of fighting, we kept them at bay for about 600 years. And during this period, what was happening was that hordes after hordes were coming they were being killed, they were being pushed back, but at the same time there was damage on our side also. The amount of Kshatri kept on depleting. And then ultimately there had to come a time when they would be invading and they had two things going for them. One was their numerical strength and second was their being war ready. And the entire population used, used to be war ready because it was, it was not a conventional war the Islamic society is exhorted to conduct a jihad which is first on every male, every male. So it was entire population which used to come and we had just a warrior class, a Kshatri class which was fighting against them. Once the amount depleted, it was just a matter of time when they would be making inroads into us. Smita Suryavankar from Belagao. You are talking of NCRT textbooks, even in uh, state textbooks also, we many times we find uh, the mixture of opposites and compound of contradictions. For example, Belwadi Mallamma, in the local history, she is portrayed as a great women ruler and a great warrior in the context of Shivaji, where he is portrayed as a villain. But in the national context, Shivaji is portrayed as a uh, savior of Hindavi Swaraj. Same happens in case of Vanake Obawa and Hyder Ali. In local history, Vanake Obawa, a watchman's wife who fought with the uh, uh, Hyder Ali's army, she is a heroine. But in the Na Mysore history, uh, she, she, uh, Hyder Ali has been portrayed as a hero. So it, it becomes very confusing and vague for the children. Who is our national hero? To whom we believe? Even in the context of regionalism, how it takes a toll on the psychology of the students. Your yes. comment, sir. In 2018 in Goa, when I was attending there, there was a large consternation that the Karnataka books were teaching a very lopsided kind of uh, history as well as literature to the students. And it was more like as if uh, missionaries and jihadis were, had taken control of the entire situation and Islam, Christianity were being glorified at the expense of Hinduism. Mm. That was being done. Um, See, what they do is, uh, the question that we missed because the, there was this time limit, 
actually we should be thinking why is it happening why would somebody do it once you can figure out that why then you, then it becomes very easy to answer what you're saying then it then it's it does not remain rocket science to understand what why is it why is it being done um, to give a very short answer in the ncit books what is being done is and uh, instantly it is being done all over the boards i have gone through andhra board telugu board punjab board haryana board everywhere the same problem is prevalent because they have created an ecosystem in the last 75 years to per to perpetuate it uh just one example should suffice that when you read ancient india there buddhism and jainism are praised why because hinduism has to be put down and you have to show something which is better in the indigenous society once they move on to the international arena then buddhism and jainism are relegated because then they move on to their ultimate objective of promoting out of india religions so this this up and down they keep on doing depending on the region they are pandering to and the constituency they are pandering to good afternoon sir myself dr manoj from vsk university balari sir uh, i think you have made a lot of good points related to history that uh, the they are given a very wrong picture of our history to our uh, the kids in my sense not only history sir in all other subjects since i am working in the karnataka board uh, with the 6 to 10th standard textbooks not only history sir even economics geography and uh, even literature uh, political science all other things are uh, on the, in the same line so can you throw a light on this sir yeah uh, my niece was in 10th class she had been given a project report to prepare on the history of pi i hope all of you know what pi is so she came to me that okay uh, help me to prepare this project report i said okay i am i'm not going to help you use google and prepare your own report so grudgingly she went took 2 3 days prepared that four page report and came to me now what was present in that report was that the first time the value of pi was calculated was in 1500 something and the journey till now all the references were from western society then i showed him original documents that the value of pi had been calculated by mathematicians in india about 5000 years ago at least 5000 years ago and again i gave him a reference from albiruni's book where he was telling in 1000 that the brahmans here know the value of pi so that is one example then uh, if you talk about mathematics i don't know how many of you have heard about fibonacci sequence fibonacci series or fibonacci numbers he was an italian mathematician in his own book he is writing that i am taking the all this from indian mathematics so this malice is far far deeper you are absolutely right it is running in all the subjects no doubt regarding this i agree with you Good evening, sir. I am Santosh from uh, Gadag. So, as you said, the colonial narratives have changed our worldview. That is true. At the same time, lot of researchers are hap research happening in the same field to decolonize from the colonial narratives. Ironically, uh, since uh, independence, we are we have implemented schemes, programs, policies on the basis of colonial narratives. so is there any way out for this kal will power that is the only solution if politicians don't show that will power then it has to be from grassroots everybody has to rise up that enough is enough that is the solution <laughs>